My dad was really tough, demanded a lot. He treated me like I was a grown man from the time I was six years old. In some ways that's good. Mm -hmm. And I do think that in a lot of ways, that is why I was able to go on and achieve a lot of the yeah. things that I achieved. Very accurate. It's a supersonic laser blast from Aikman to Herman for a touchdown. But boy, you give up a lot. Mm -hmm. You give up a lot of childhood. Your face just changed. Yeah, you give up. Yeah. You know, you give up a lot. Yeah. When you're treated like that at a young age. I don't recall any laughter in our house. And, you know, everybody kind of walked around on eggshells. I'm not that way as a father. Mm -hmm. But with that said, I'm better now. But there were times then when you were around that, it made you uncomfortable. You know, you just weren't used to experiencing that. You know, you'd hear this laughter and stuff going on. And you're like, what's going on? Do you think you were proving something to him as you were achieving? I think I, I think I always wanted to prove to him I was as tough as he was. I think that was what it was. Tough. Yeah. You had to be tough to survive in our house. And he was pound for pound the toughest person I've ever known. You're an amazing son. I'm sure he's unbelievably proud of you. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Today's special. It's not every day you sit across from a three-time Super Bowl champion, Super Bowl MVP. Let's just be real. One of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. One of the greatest athletes of all time. And by the way, ironically... I think actually one of the most underrated oh, well, athletes of all you. time. It's thank a fact. You. But actually, as impressive as his football career was, I like the fact that the dream didn't stop there and he was able to post-football create an incredible brand, an incredible career, an incredible life post-football. So I just want to pick the brain of the great Troy Aikman. Troy, good to have you. Yeah, great to be on. Great to meet you. Yeah, I've been you, looking forward to this. You too. By the way, he's also an entrepreneur. We ought to just talk about that first. <laughs> yeah. He's a, he's in the beer yeah. business now. Yep. Tell me about yep. that a little it's bit. Been a, it's been an interesting year and a half or so. Actually, we started uh, two years before we launched. We've, we've now been in stores for a year and a half, strictly in Texas. But I worked for a distributorship in college. Uh, I like beer. Uh, I don't drink a lot. But you don't when look I, like you drink any. Yeah, no. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, I met my partners, and uh, we started – kicking it around and seeing if it's something that I might want to do. And, and, uh, you know, I, I work out, uh, I, I'm mindful of what I put in my body, all those things. And I said, well, if we can do something that complements my lifestyle, then I'm all for it. And so, uh, we spent two years, uh, coming up with the recipe and what's unique about eight, uh, which is the name of the beer is that we're hundred percent organic grains. We have no mm -hmm. adjuncts and no fillers. So we're the only widely available beer that can stay, that can say that. Uh, every other widely available beer adds corn, rice, sure. syrup, or sugar. So there's a lot of junk that's thrown in there. Mm. Uh, ours has none of that, and yet we're still at 90 calories and just 2.6 carbs. That so, was my next question yeah. on those two things. So it's been really good. And, and you know, I feel like we're a lifestyle brand, quite honestly, because the people who I've always been inspired by are the people who never settle and the people who do the work and, and, and all those things that mm. – and I feel like I'm one of those people, you know, and that's why I, I, I'm usually drawn to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's really who this beer was made for. Now, anyone who wants to drink it that wants a better for you beer mm -hmm. uh, will certainly accept. But, By the way, uh, you're in the right demo in this audience. They yeah. can drink beer and be healthy and yeah. it's actually unique. They can get it anywhere? Where can you get it? In Texas. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, distributed across the entire state. Okay. Eventually, we, we hope that we'll move outside of Texas and – you know, be in other states. Let's and get I think, it online so we can buy it online. Can yeah. It uh, I don't know what the restrictions are on that. Either. I've been asked about that a lot. Yeah. Um, Shipping but it's done it maybe, really well. So yeah. we just we just kicked off our second year, mm -hmm. and a lot of good stuff is happening. So. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. You, uh, like I said, you've had this incredible life. I wanna, I'm going to ask you hard stuff today, stuff that I don't think you get asked all the time. I had a chance a few weeks ago. I was with Brady for a few days at an event. And uh, I've been blessed that I get to have been around some guys that played your position at a pretty high level. Um, Woody John Elway's been a friend yeah. of mine for a long time. What's a through line for the great leaders in anything, but especially we'll just take quarterbacks now. What's a through line? And don't be humble today. Between like a Troy Aikman, because you're different personalities, very different. Troy Aikman, a John Elway, a Tom Brady. What is the through line that made you all great leaders? I know there's differences, but what's a through line? Yeah, I think uh... – we are all different. We all lead uh, in a different way, which is which is true of, of any field, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, but I think that probably what the through line is for all 
great quarterbacks, great leaders at that position, uh, or in general, is that they they put in the work and and they're not outworked, you know. And I think that that first of all, you got to play well, but right. but you have to also be the guy who your teammates understand is is there putting in the work and doing what's necessary mm. in order to be the best that you can be. And I think that those guys that you mentioned, I'd like to think that I'm one of them as well. Mm. That uh, your teammates never questioned your commitment, your dedication. Uh, and your persistence to being the best that you could be. Why um, does it matter? Like I, I uh, like in business as an entrepreneur, I tell entrepreneurs one of the reasons you got to outwork everybody is when you're leading a team. An ironic thing, and I, maybe this isn't true in football, but I think it is. You actually create safety for everybody around you, stability when you're the hardest working person in the room and the leader. I think that's one of those like invisible things. Like you actually have created a sense of stability just by your mere presence and your work ethic that doesn't exist if you're a little bit hit and miss in an environment. Do you see that? Yeah. And I and I think that in in football, maybe this is true in all sports, but I know that that what I can relate to is the dynamics of a locker room uh, and within an organization. And what generally happens is for the quarterback, the quarterback, the franchise quarterback, is always viewed as the guy who didn't really have to fight necessarily for his pay. He's been treated well. Mm. You know, that, okay, well, the organization, and, and maybe even more so now, even though we've seen situations where some quarterbacks have had to hold out and hopefully get what they feel is their, you know, uh, correct, corrected pay. Yeah. But I think in general, uh, when you have a franchise quarterback, it's like, oh, okay, well, his contract's up, so we pay him, and then we move on, and these other guys are holding out, and then they got to, you know, they got to fight a little harder. The quarterback usually has great relationships with not only the coaches, but also the owner himself, and mm -hmm. And all that. So I think that with that, the quarterback has to, in his way, make the other players, his teammates, understand that that he's with them. You mm -hmm. know, that he's one of them, and that he's doing the work just like they are. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not always easy to do. And there there have been those quarterbacks, those guys, those franchise quarterbacks that have struggled mm -hmm. uh, in that area. And yeah. it's and and it's not easy. And and not to get off tangent, but. Mm -hmm. I think that becomes a challenge right now with what we're seeing in college with the NIL is that yeah. now you've got you've got 18 year olds instead of 24 year olds that are having to navigate those waters of getting paid more than the rest of the players within the locker room and how do you do that? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not easy. That's interesting because I uh, I've had a chance I uh, had Peyton Manning I've interviewed Peyton I interviewed John Montana and then you and when I when people make their list this is which is interesting to me I don't know if you take this personally or not. But when people go, okay, my top five quarterbacks of all time, you're usually going to hear Joe's name. You're going right. to hear Brady's name. Right. And then they'll interchange, you know, Marino, Peyton, Peyton. Manning, right. you know, uh, whoever. They get their, right. their list. Rodgers, I guess, is on that list somehow now. <laughs> but uh, Mahomes I want to know where Otto Graham is. Right. That well, guy won like 10 championships I know, he doesn't back get in the day. Yeah. But what is it <laughs> – in your case, I mean, it's clear – you should be in that. And by the way, I'm sure on many lists you are. I don't mean to say. Well, that. no, you, that's not. Well, no, I'm not. I'm not. And, and why? And, and quite honestly, Ed, it it does it it doesn't affect me at all. I mean, mm -hmm. it really doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I played the game hoping that one day I would be thought of amongst the greats of all time, and mm -hmm. I and I feel like that happened by the simple fact that I'm in the Hall of Fame. That kind of helps. Uh, yeah. But you know, when you're talking about okay, name the top five, I wouldn't right. probably be in there. Maybe I would be if they mentioned the top ten. Mm -hmm. But I understand that, that my career really was about winning championships, which ultimately is what everyone's career should be about. Right. That's what they pay us for. Right. Uh, right. But I think that the world that we're in, with especially with fantasy football, and then for those fans or people who are making those lists, uh, that if they didn't see me play, they look at stats and yeah. they say, okay, well, shoot. I mean, Troy, my numbers are pretty modest uh, mm -hmm. relative to many others. And and, for, and there's reasons for that. Uh, you know, Emmett, of course, there's a reason why he's the all-time leading rusher. And, <laughs> you know, but when we didn't throw the ball as often. But when we threw it, we, we threw it as well as anybody. Sure. Uh, and, and that's why Michael Irvin's in the – in the Hall of Fame as well. So, no. Uh, it doesn't bother you. I'm, it, it does not bother me. In fact, during my Hall of Fame speech, what I mentioned was that I, I feel like everyone talks about how team comes first. You, you never hear a player say that, oh, no, I, I'm all about me. You know, they'll say, hey, I just want to win. <laughs> right. But there's very few, as you know, mm -hmm. who really only want to win. They want to yeah. win 
as long as they're also putting up their big numbers, you know. Yes. For me, uh, I felt like I did sacrifice individually. Mm-hmm. I felt like I could throw the ball as well as anybody, sure. but I feel like I did sacrifice individually for what was best for the team. And so the greatest reward for that was that I then received the greatest honor an individual can ever receive, and that is to be uh, voted into the Pro Football Hall of oh, Fame. Fame. So that's what that's what meant so much to me, and uh, and the rest of it. Uh, I'm I'm proud of my career. Of uh, you know, overly proud of it. If someone had told me, I you know, I always wanted to be a professional athlete. If someone had told me that. I was going to go on and win three world championships and, and, and have the teammates and the career that I was able to have. I'd, I would have taken it you know, all day long. And so uh, I'm proud of it. And where that ranks or where everyone else thinks I des- – I, it just it, – you know, I've never, I've never really uh, – It's not something you – Well done. That. It's just it's not – Because you know a lot of guys, other guys do. I mean, look at look at Michael Jordan's Hall of yeah. Fame speech. He's yeah. considered the goat, and he's still like nailing dudes, you know. Like, yeah, right. And right, there's nothing right. wrong with that. I just there's an yeah. ego that comes with being great at anything that I think is a healthy ego. But you did. You're also known as like one of the most accurate throwers of the football of all time, right? One of the most cerebral guys. Like, stuff that quarterbacks do. I asked Noel Mazzone one time, you know, the quarterback guru did, yeah. and he's like probably the most accurate guy I've seen throw the football was actually Troy Aikman. But it was all the other things. It's actually getting into protections that you're supposed to get into. Right. I remember when. Peyton really couldn't throw anymore. Yeah. Yet they ended up doing a lot better with him than they did with um, uh, with Brock because of his ability just pre-snap to get them into different fo- the right, right formations and block. And, you know, obviously you know a lot more about that than I do. But I want to ask you also about your career. I'm, always, I'm just fascinated by the people that are the best. Like people don't realize this because they watch it on TV, but every guy that's out there in the NFL was not only the best player, more than likely on their, you know, their high school team, but they became elite in college. You were a UCLA guy. Did you come from Nebraska before that? Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Yeah. So you didn't get it at Oklahoma. You end up red shirting at UCLA yeah. and ends up winning three Super Bowls and an MB- a Super Bowl MVP. But I look at guys like that are just different. And I think what's the commonality? Because even me as an entrepreneur, I'm different than Elon Musk. I'm not anywhere near as wealthy as Elon Musk. But, you know, Phil Knight, Elon Musk, and, uh, you know, Mark Cuban, three very different dudes. What's right. the through line, right? And I look at Jimmy Johnson. I look at Bill Belichick, Bill Walsh, and let's just say uh, Andy Reid right now. They're very different for human beings. Yeah. You know all of them or knew all of them yeah. or met them. What is common amongst them that made them great leaders? That's a tough well, one. Well, that's a great question. I mean, it really is because I, I actually was just having this conversation with somebody that for the most part, for the most part, I would say if you tell me someone's a player's coach – I will tell you, then they probably haven't won at the highest level in general. <laughs> okay. In general. All right. Okay. But I think Andy Reid would be regarded as a player's coach, and he's mm. been one of the most successful coaches in the history of the game. Mm. So, uh, but I do think that players in general, they, they, they want to be coached by people that they know are going to make them better. Right. You know, and that's that's the bottom line. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the key. And so do they know something that I don't, mm-hmm. and they can put me in a position to where I can achieve the things that I want to achieve, both individually and then as well for us as a team. This is true in business. True in, yeah, true yeah, in yeah, life, yeah. true in everything. Right. I mean, it really is. Mm-hmm. And so there's obviously a lot of parallels between sports and, mm-hmm. and business and other things. But – you know, you take Bill Belichick, for instance. I've talked to a number of people, uh, you know, clearly regarded as, you know, what may be the greatest coach of all time. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's on certainly a short list. But, you know, he's not a whole lot different in a lot of ways from the guy that we see. Mm-hmm. But when you talk to people who have played for the Patriots, I said, how how is he so effective? And they say, we know that if we do what he asks us to do, mm-hmm there's a really good probability that we're going to win the we're game. We're going to win, right. And Did so, you feel the way about Jimmy? Yeah, hmm. yeah. And Jimmy was tough. I mean, Jimmy was hmm. really tough. He, he demanded a lot, attention to detail. Hmm. Uh, no detail was too small. Hmm. Um, and, and, and we worked hard, you know. So we had really talented players. That was his – Jimmy's greatest strength probably was, was his evaluator – his evaluating of talent. I mean, hmm. he was sensational at that. So we had really talented players that worked exceptionally hard, and then Jimmy didn't let anything slide. And mm-hmm. so that's a pretty good formula. I watched something, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, 
I happen to be watching. We have some mutual friends that are involved at, at Fox Sports for football. And uh, I watched the day that they told Jimmy Johnson that he had made the Hall of Fame. And then they threw to you. Yeah. And I watched your reaction. And I thought, I don't know that these guys necessarily got along that well when a dude's beating the drum when you're playing and, you know, threatening you with, if you don't, I'm going to play Walsh or whatever. Yeah. What's going on yeah. in your career, right? Yeah. But you sincerely seemed emotional yeah. about it on his yeah. behalf. And I wonder if that's just because when you're forged in a battle, even though you're building a company or a family or a football team, that when you get to the other side of that, although it may be messy in the, in the middle, that at the end there's this tremendous admir- you know, admiration that you've done something great together. Is that what that was or what was it? Because you were pretty emotional. Yeah, uh, and I didn't know that he was going to be told that he was going into the Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were going to halftime, and my producer said to me, hey, uh, the studio wants you to watch the a little bit of this halftime show. They, they're going to be doing something. Wow. And I just thought, okay, they're going to be doing something, and then sometime in the second half, I'm going to be asked to maybe talk on it. Uh, and so I'm just watching what's going on, and then when I see David Baker walk mm-hmm. out, who was running the Pro Football Hall of Fame, then I knew that, that Jimmy was going in, and I knew that there was a chance, but I had no idea that he was going to be told that night. No I thought way. he was going to be months before he was going to ever find out. Okay. Um, and so why I was emotional, Ed, was, was you're right. Our career. I've known Jimmy since I was about 14 years old. He was okay. recruiting me uh, out of high school when he was at Oklahoma State. Okay. And I didn't go to Oklahoma State, of course, and then he went to Miami, recruited me there, and I didn't go there. And then I go to Dallas, and he's – he takes over for Tom Landry. So now he's coaching me. And then he drafted Steve Walsh. Or, mm-hmm. And 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 you're right. It got off to a really tough start. But he and I have gotten – we're really close. And so he's never gone into uh, the Ring of Honor uh, mm-hmm. at Cowboy Stadium where they have all the names. And, you know, we all feel, those of us that played for him, feel that if any of us are in the Ring of Honor, he certainly should be in the Ring of Honor. But mm-hmm. that's a decision for Jerry Jones to make. And so – I never was certain he would get into the Pro Football Hall of Fame because he hadn't coached long enough yeah. was the reason. Not that he didn't deserve to be in. I just didn't think that, well, he he wanted to go on and do do his boat and be in South Florida and all that. And so I just didn't know that because he'd been a finalist for a number of years. Hmm. And so knowing how much that meant to him and had not yet been recognized for what he had done for those teams with the Cowboys – uh, for to see him go into the Pro Football Hall of Fame uh, that night was was really special. I mean, that's why I was so emotional. Just mm-hmm. I was I was so happy for him. Mm-hmm. And then uh, to take it a step further is he asked me to be his presenter. Um, I did, I did so I presented him then, wow. which was the is the greatest honor. I mean, the the greatest uh, athletic honor I've ever received is as I mentioned going into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. The greatest honor I've ever received in general was Jimmy Johnson asking me to be his presenter because the, the, when you go into the Hall of Fame, you can ask anybody you want to yeah. be your presenter. Wow. And so when he asked me, I just thought, man, that's that is uh, huge. That's a that's a pretty special yeah. uh, thing. And so how wonderful, man. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Speaking of emotions, dealing with failure. It's part of being an athlete. Yeah. And I think back to I just watching a lot of football. I, your rookie year was not gorgeous. So yeah. most people that listen to my show may not even be football fans, but I'm, I'm interested to hear, why don't you describe it a little bit, tell them what happened your rookie year, which was not, you weren't winning a Super Bowl that year. No. And, and, um, <laughs> no. and how you dealt with a lot of the rejection and failure, criticism that came with it, and probably even to this day you get criticism, people saying things about you that aren't real yeah. favorable. How do yeah. you deal with that? Uh, no, it's a, it's, my rookie year was, I guess it when I first got, criticized or had to deal with that was at Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I was trying to run an offense that just didn't fit my skills. And Mm -hmm. and so it was a real challenge. And OU, of course, is a a hotbed for football. And and we were pretty good at the time. And Mm -hmm. I was probably holding us back just because we're trying to run this wishbone offense. And it just wasn't, Mm -hmm. wasn't for me. So that was the first time I really had to deal with it. I broke my leg. And then I went to UCLA and ended up going to Dallas as the number one overall pick. But I went to the worst team in football, and then my rookie year, uh, you know, new head coach, college coach, bringing in a lot of different players every week. Uh, we, we really did not have much of a fighting chance. I was 0-11 as a starter. That's crazy. And, and 
it was tough. I took a beating. Uh, we weren't very good up front. Mm. Um, 0 and 11, everyone. 0 and 11. Mm. And so there were games where we should have lost mm. based on how I played. Um, and then there were other games where I thought I played pretty well, you know, mm. and, and we'd have a lead with 30 seconds left in the game and somehow we'd lose it, you know. Yeah. And, and I just remember thinking, man, what does it take to win a game in this league? I mean, this is, this is a brutal. Game. Right. And uh, but I never lost confidence, and mm. I and I think the reason was I had a quarterback coach by the name of Jerry Rome, and he had played in the NFL, and and he just he refused to let me get down on myself, mm. um, and and there were days when it was hard. It was hard to be positive. It was hard to be upbeat. It was hard to believe that good things were going to happen. But but he was always there, being my champion, and he mm. was in my corner, and. Uh, and so, fortunately, my very first game, my second season, we won. And so I got that monkey off my back. And then over time, we slowly got better and better. And then, of course, we won the Super Bowl uh, in my fourth year and, and had great success. But, yeah, I just think that – Does criticism hurt you even now? Well, nobody likes it. Yeah. You know, it's easy. I, I hear people say, hey, I don't pay any attention to criticism. Mm -hmm. I have a hard time believing that anyone – uh, just can totally brush it off. Mm. Uh, but if you get criticized enough, <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and I'm in, and I'm now that I'm still in the public eye with yeah. the broadcasting and all that, that, uh, you just learn that, that it's just part of it. You yeah. know, uh, someone once told me that, Hey, it's part of the, you know, it comes with the dinner mm. and, and criticism just comes with the dinner. And, and, you know, I'll read Twitter from time to time. And, and if, and if you've called a game and you read Twitter, be oh, buckle up because oh I mean, it, I can't even. But some of the it's some of it's pretty funny, mm -hmm. uh, and and I laugh at most of it. But what I like, the reason I do it is because you know, you mm -hmm. know deep down, if there's truth to those criticisms, sure, you know, yeah. And so I try to evaluate myself objectively, mm -hmm. and I don't dismiss that. I mean, I I I, I listen and then think. Yeah, you know what? They're right. Me too. They're right. That I do the same. I kind of dig some of it. Yeah. Some of it's ridiculous, yeah. but some of it I'm like, you know what? That's I've heard this enough times. There's some validity to this. That's right. I do need to make that adjustment. Yeah. And it, yeah. it's a, it's a bit of a wake up, and 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 all that's good. So I I I don't I don't mind it. I mean, I, I honestly don't mind it. What and about even if the criticism? If you know deep down, like yeah. you've you've done your best and mm -hmm. whatever it is, and then you just accept it and move on. And and now, as you know, I mean. Uh, the critics now everyone has a platform, so uh, you get you get all the I, I, everyone gets criticized now. I mean, you just yeah, gotta, we don't we definitely don't lack feedback in yeah, this day and yeah, age. There's yeah. plenty of feedback. I want to ask you about winning. I've always wanted to ask somebody who's won a lot. This I'll just be honest with you. So the things that have happened in my life where I've kind of won in business or whatever, there were there were um, it was amazing. There were elements of it that were better than what I thought it was going to be, but there were also elements of it that surprised me. And I'm curious, you win this. And as much as you can go back and really be there, you win this first Super Bowl. Maybe you're still on the field. You're in the locker room. It's the next day. Was it what you thought it would be? Like, did you feel what you thought you would feel? Because there's these new studies that actually yeah. say that you get more dopamine in the pursuit of something. That actually when you hit it, there's like a dopamine crash in your brain. And it's like, is that all there is? There's a little bit yeah. of a letdown. Yeah. Did you have that happen to you what did it really feel well, like well i'll take you back a little bit earlier than that okay. Uh, okay. when when i was about 14 years old i couldn't wait to get my driver's license okay i mean i thought that anyone who could drive how could they ever have a bad day in their life <laughs> i mean i just thought that how right. could you ever be upset right. about anything i mean right. you can drive right well, you turn 16, you get your driver's license, and you, you you learn to drive and all that, and you've got a car, and, and then you realize that, hey, you still have bad days, and, mm. and, and that always stuck with me. Mm. So, I've, so I, I, I've always known that achievement isn't going to it, – it's not going to fulfill you anymore. I mean, it, you, you, you're proud, mm. and you're working towards that, and you, know, you reach these goals – but it doesn't it, – it's not going to make you any happier. Mm. It's not – you know, that comes from a totally different place. Now, I will tell you, I was I was in my 50s before I really figured that part of it out. Really? And so uh, – but when I won my my first Super Bowl, I I knew – it was at least I knew that was in my back pocket, yeah. and that's what I was drafted to do. So mm -hmm. that's where the satisfaction came, like – for the rest of my career, mm -hmm. they can't say I can't win the big one. Was or, it was it satisfaction or relief? Uh, 
Great question. I, I would say, in all honesty, it was, it was more relief. Yeah. 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 Because I was never one of these athletes who uh, people would say, how come, you, how come you don't smile more? How come right. you don't, you know, you don't look like you're really enjoying playing. Mm. I, I didn't smile or enjoy it till it was over, <laughs> till we won, yeah. you know, till we won the game. I mean, that's yeah. when. Mm-hmm. That's when you were really able to mm-hmm. uh, in, enjoy the effort. Yes. Uh, but during it, uh, no. I mean, it was a, it was a grind, you mm-hmm. know. So, but yeah, I think I, I think in all honesty, it was it, it was more more relief. That's been my emotion too. It's interesting you say that. Like it wasn't what I thought it would be. Although there's other benefits that come with it that you don't dream of or imagine as well. But it's almost like okay, a little yeah. bit of relief. <laughs> yeah. But the other thing that's unique about you, brother, is that you repeat. And I know it's a team sport, but we're going to get into broadcasting in a minute. Then you repeated, I mean, most of you know this, but if you don't, I mean, Troy has had this prolific career at Fox. Now he's at Monday Night Football at uh, ABC. He's like, he's the number one sports broadcaster in football now. He's also become number one of that. So he's guys that has to leave college to go to UCLA because the offense didn't work for him. Ends up becoming a, the number one pick in the draft. Ends up being one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. And then after that, duplicates it with a career that's been dominant. And by the way, he could be a professional bodybuilder if he wanted to be right now, too. <laughs> so, like, the guy and the guy is this finds this way to the top position. But a lot of people don't deal very well with rejection or failure. But a lot, a lot, and you know this, whether it's been business people you've met in your life or people that are in a good relationship or an athlete. Like we're talking about the UFC guys that I work with or the boxers. Guys work really hard to win a championship, and then something happens to them after they win a championship. That hunger, the drive, whatever yeah. it is, they don't. Most people deal very poorly with winning. Is yeah. the truth? It seems like that has not happened to you. No, it hasn't. Uh, and I, I think in general, m- most people, uh, well. My approach, whether it's in football or whether it was in broadcasting or it's in my personal life, is that most people aren't willing to do the work. Yep. I mean, that's that's what I believe. And, mm-hmm. and I don't know where it came from for me. I don't know if it was the way I was raised by my father. Uh, but that, to me, is the is what has driven me throughout my life and in, in, in everything that I've done. Now, the Super Bowl, as far as that goes, I, I can't imagine winning a Super Bowl and then not being more hungry than you were. And the reason I say that is because it is such a great experience mm. that how could you not want to go and do that again and again? But and you again. played with the guys you didn't. You played with the guys. I've been with, I've been with, and I've seen those, I've seen those teams and, and, and we all see, cause it's, mm. it is, it's a bit of human nature. Uh, Jimmy was great in our repeat, Jimmy Johnson, uh, in, in how he treated us harder. I mean, he worked us harder mm. the second year. Mm. Uh, he, and, and there was a reason for that. Mm. Uh, Jimmy was a psychology major, and he felt that hey, now's when people get complacent. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to allow it, mm-hmm. and so he 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 worked us even that much harder. But mm-hmm. you know, Ed, I'm asked a lot about why I work out so much, yep. why I do all this, and 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 the reason really is simple that uh, I feel like my success as a, as a player was because I just refused to be outworked. And so I was going to do what was ever, whatever was required. And when I got into broadcasting, I'm not the greatest speaker in the world. Mm. And, uh, but I just said, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give myself at least a fighting chance and mm. I'm going to, I'm going to put more time into this. And so I, I work hard at, at, at mm. trying to be as prepared as I possibly can be to go into a broadcast. And then with the working out now in my personal life, it's been about discipline uh, and commitment. And mm. if I let myself go, I feel like it. I, I feel like then I become a bit of a fraud, and what I Sorry. believe is the foundation of who I am and why I've been able to have some degree of success. And so I think it, it's it, you know when you talk about a through line, when you've been asking me those questions, but that that's the through line for me. It's right. discipline, it's consistency, and it's commitment. Yeah, you're the product. He, everyone, you know, this is an audio show, but we're on YouTube as well. But um, I mean, Troy's in better shape right now than when he played. I mean, he's. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not. Not yeah. exaggerating this. I'm yeah. not blowing smoke at him. Troy is. Uh, when you're a fit dude, I'm pretty fit. You know, you notice it in guys, especially if they're over 45 or 50 years old. Troy is in a magnificent, like shredded shape. What are some of your routines to do this? So, do you have? Are you, you? You strike me as a dude. Now that I've met you, I bet you burn pretty hot. You're an intense dude. I bet yeah. you have a good time. Yeah, but there's no, this, that's true. You, that's you, true. You, you burn hot. You're an intense <laughs> yeah. dude. So am I. And and um, I admire that about you. I think you are the product that you claim to be. And those are the people I like to be around the most. Yeah. Like they live what they say. 
as much as they can. Yeah. We all have these weaknesses in our life. So what are some of your routines? Uh, Fitness-wise, I know meditation's a big deal yep. for you. Like, what does a day look like for you? Is it regimented or is every day different? Uh, it's pretty regimented. Uh, I, I'd like for it to be a little bit different, but I know what works for me, and I just kind of I, I, I stick with that. Uh, I've, always, I've always worked out with weights. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I follow some people on Instagram. I follow mm-hmm. yourself on mm-hmm. all the motivational stuff. Mm-hmm. But I listen to Mark Hyman. I'm, I, mm-hmm. I've become somewhat of a dis- disciple of his. Okay. Uh, but it, it was always even when I re- when I retired, a lot of players will just be burned out on working out. Right. Uh, and then others go go hardcore. Uh, I just kept doing it. Um, mm-hmm. And so I continued to lift four days a week. Okay. I was doing cardio. My cardio was running four to six miles every day, and I. In, in in a in a year, if I took five days off from cardio, in a year I'd say that's probably a high number. My um, gosh, yeah. really? And so then uh, I started having some hip issues about three years ago, and I had to had to stop running. Uh, and now I do the indoor bike. So I do. Uh, and then with COVID hit, I knew that. People were going to go one of two ways, and most people were going to really get in worse shape. Yeah. And I just, uh, again, said to myself, I'm not going to be one of those people. I'm, In fact, I ratcheted it up even more wow. to where then I had always been a good eater. I, I, I rarely would eat uh, poor meals or mm-hmm. have cheat meals. But then I just got really, really disciplined. Mm-hmm. I, I don't like the word strict. I just got more and more disciplined in that. And now my routine, Ed, has gotten crazy. I mean, people that know me, I'm, I, I carry this jug around with the water. Hold I on. drink it out. Uh, There's mine. Hey, hey, we got the same, same one. Same exact jug, brother. Come on now. I love there it. There we go. I love it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, I was drinking up to three gallons a day. You're drink, peeing all the time. All the time. Yeah. And then I, was, then I read that you, get, you hit a, a certain number, right. it doesn't matter anymore. Right. And right. so I said, well, that's a relief. So I, yeah. I backed off. But I do that. Um, I meditate. I've been meditating for about 10 years. It's changed my life. Uh, and then I got the cold plunge. I do the yeah. sauna. Yeah. I do that every every evening before I go to bed. And and just about a month ago, I got red light therapy. <laughs> got the red light stuff going. But, I mean, if I read about it, then I want to incorporate it. Yeah. And I, I've made – I've always been a good sleeper, but now I just will not uh, relent on my sleep. Mm. I just make it an absolute priority. Mm. And it, it is, it's the best I've ever felt in yeah. my life. By the way, I mean, I, all of those are my jam. I yeah. have a red light therapy bed. It's a great, I got a therapy bed. I just bed. started the red light, yeah. uh, about two weeks ago. Brother, it's awesome. By the way, one thing you can do too, that there's a setting on there for sleep. You have a Theralite bed. Do you know which bed you have? Do you, do you I've have? got a panel. You have I've a panel. Got a, okay. Yeah. Cause the thing I have actually can actually program it for sleep too. So my sleep's oh, wow. actually got deeper off the just for the record i was talking to alex guerrero yeah a few weeks ago tom's trainer and we were talking about cold plunge cold therapy sauna stuff and i'm going to play with this i'm just giving it to you i can't validate this medically but he did say that he does think some intermittent break from it that there is an adaptation your body Uh goes through and so he recommended to me a little bit of a break and then your body recalibrates and the cold plunge and the cold therapy works a little bit better yeah so i do that too i i do know uh well the other i i first thing i do in the morning is take a cold shower uh and i haven't had a hot shower period i haven't had a hot shower in probably four months uh since i started okay so you are even crazier than me you're crazy crazy okay yeah Yeah. i i haven't had a hot shower and and uh but the, the between the cold plunge and the cold showers it it totally has changed my nervous system me too i mean in a really positive way i yeah. i would get anxious about things i i'd have i had some social anxiety really uh and i i i don't want to say i don't have any of it anymore but i don't think i have any of it anymore i mean i just <laughs> i just don't feel it you know i just don't and i and i tell people i said it's the greatest thing in the world and i've mm. got two daughters that are in college mm. And I, I, I would mention to them I meditate back mm-hmm. when they were in you know middle school and, and high school and they 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 they've gotten used to this whole thing I mean they they kind of laugh about it mm-hmm. but you know I don't push it on them but I mm-hmm. try to expose them to it and mm-hmm. you know they'll pick it up at their you know at their leisure yeah. and when the time's right but on the same they way. work out mm-hmm. um, and that's always just the, you know that's been part of the what they've grown up with so I like that I like that they've picked up on. On the lifestyle of working out, you meditate in the morning, well. Troy. When do you meditate? 
usually. I meditate first thing in the morning. You do yeah, too. after you do. I after I shower. Yeah. One of the things I don't know if you do this at all too, but by the way, I love that you have such a regimented routine. My confidence, I think, now that I look back on it, I think my confidence comes from the fact that I know I'm not going to get outworked. Yeah. And I know that um, under pressure, I have reflexively good habits that serve me. Right. When pressure's cranked up, I sense yep. that with you too. One of the things for me, meditation was very difficult because I am wired pretty tight and I'm always going, my mind's always yep. thinking. And so meditation was this great gift for me. But one of the things that I've been doing lately with my meditation, I'm just curious if you do it since we're talking about it. I love focusing on my breathing when I meditate. I actually, you know, you're supposed to empty your mind, but one of the things I do lately is I've been really intentional about feeling and sensing my breath. Like breath work is like the next frontier. So I've done the cold plunge. I've done the sauna stuff. I've done the training. I do the 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 lot of the water a gallon gallon and a half a day i'm in meditation mode what's the next thing the red light therapy the next thing for me has been like breathing work breath work have you done any of that so my meditation sometimes i feel like uh i i'm i uh, sometimes i feel like i'm not advancing like others Mm -hmm. uh in that space because i only focus on my breath you do okay and i know there's a lot of different ways to meditate but i only uh, focus so solely uh, mm-hmm. on my breath and then the mind and then I bring it back you know mm-hmm. and I hear people say all the time and I'm like you I mean mm-hmm. I I thought man this is gonna be this is gonna be tough mm-hmm. um, but the way that it's I've been to a few retreats I've been mm-hmm. to a couple retreats silent mm-hmm. retreats um, you ever follow sad guru do you know that no. is no okay but the, you talk about yeah. the breath work yeah. uh, Wim Hof Yes. Uh, you know, I mean, I've had people who are doing his techniques, and mm-hmm. I, he's another that I follow, mm-hmm. and he definitely is into the cold. Sure is. Um, and and some people that are like-minded like us, mm-hmm. they, they tell me that they're doing some of his techniques mm-hmm. in the morning first thing mm-hmm. and how life-changing that has been. Yep. Now, I will tell you that <clears throat> the reason I started meditating 10 years ago is because I just felt, Ed, that, gosh, if if – if anyone should be happy in this world, if anyone has achieved everything that they had hoped to achieve, my dream, my my whole life was to be a professional athlete, right. and I was able to do that, and and I was able to have this great lifestyle from it. I was broadcasting, and you know, able, and I called a game at the Super Bowl. Uh, it was the helmet catch, uh, David Tyree, when he yeah. beat Tom Brady mm-hmm. and the Patriots when they were undefeated at the mm-hmm. time. And I remember after that game, uh, Ron Jaworski came up to me and said, man, that was an unbelievable game. How about that? And I said, oh, yeah, it was great, Ed, mm-hmm. or uh, Jaws. And mm-hmm. um, he says, oh, yeah. You know, and I said, yeah. And he goes, what's wrong? And I said, ah, you know, I, Jaws, I didn't really – I didn't do anything. I just talked about it, you know. And mm-hmm. um, when I played in those games and we won, I mean, heck, I'd be the most excited guy in the room. Uh, he walked – he kind of had this quizzical look, you know, mm-hmm. and walked away and – I've never even had this conversation with Ron. Mm. Uh, but I remember thinking to myself, man, if this is as good as it gets, I just called what may be the greatest game ever played, and, and yet I feel totally empty. And so I started thinking, man, what? if anyone should be happy, it should be me. And what's missing, you know? Mm. And uh, I, I started looking up stuff, reading about stuff, really? and, and meditation was kind of and, – and that's why I say it's really, it's really changed my life. Uh, and it's allowed me, and more so in the last couple of years – uh, because of some personal things that really mm-hmm. made me take a real hard look at myself and, mm-hmm. and figure some things out. Mm-hmm. And meditation has had a huge role in that because mm-hmm. for the longest time when I started meditating, I did it, but I didn't really, but the light never came on as mm-hmm. to what are the benefits of this. I, yeah. I kept doing it. Yeah. But then about probably three years ago, I read a book called The Untethered Soul yep. by Michael Singer great book yeah and 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 i tried to read it probably two years prior to that and i couldn't get through it i was just like this Mm. is too much and then i read it three years ago and whatever it was that was in that book all of a sudden it just all became crystal clear and it changed it it's changed my life and so all this stuff the water Mm. and the cold plunge and all that all that's great and it's Mm. a but uh really the the reason i feel as good as i do is because of what meditation has, has thank you meant for in my s- life. saying that yeah just to meet you in the middle same with me i've always and i can't even be on if i'm really being honest because i do that on our show i don't know that i'm on the other side of what you just described completely yet i no. still i still go if anyone should be 
yeah happy and real blissful in their life on a regular basis it really ought to be me and um i'm not enough now i will say what you said my faith and my meditation practices have enhanced it tremendously but i still feel like in my case there's several levels beyond it where I could be more present in the moment and just enjoy that yeah. moment more. That's what meditation's given me is a little bit more of, okay, I'm I'm in this moment right now. And there isn't another one. The the last one I just had doesn't really exist. It's a figure of imagination and the one coming after this doesn't exist yeah. either. But for me too, if I'm being really honest, I uh still um now, part of that, I think, is both of our wiring that that's why we dealt with winning well because we're Well, that's what I was going to ask you. What meditation has given me is stillness. You know, when yeah. people ask me, what does it do for you? I mean, the, the word that comes to mind is it, it gives me stillness in my life because I was like you that, you know, I just always wanted, I just yeah. had to go, go, mm -hmm. go, go. And trying to meditate and sit still for that, I just, you know, I just felt like, God, oh, there's things I need to do. and I got, mm -hmm. But now I can just meditate and just totally take in the moment. But mm -hmm. the, the you're probably like me in this regard then, too, that... You know, I was hard on myself. Me too. You know, you, you, that it's crazy that you mm. expect perfection. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would expect myself to be perfect. It didn't matter if it was playing football. It didn't matter if it was giving some speech. It, mm -hmm. it, whatever it was, I just and, – and it was crazy because I there was no reason why I should be perfect. You know, I, right. that wasn't even my field or whatever right. it was that I was mm -hmm. so upset with myself about, you know. Mm -hmm. But I was hard on myself. And mm -hmm. so I've had to – I've had to kind of work through all of that. You know, I've mm -hmm. done a lot of personal work. And, and, I can see it. Yeah, and it's and that. So there's a, there's a lot going on there. And, yeah. and you know, I, I'm, I'm thrilled that I found it in my 50s. I wish mm -hmm. I'd discovered it in my 30s, but, uh, but, but I'm really grateful that, that life hasn't passed me by without getting to this point. Yeah, I have a funny feeling, brother, that you're going to talk a lot more about this over time, and you may end up dabbling over in my side of things. I could see you really reaching a lot of people with this as the more and more you dig deeper and understand more about you and what you're doing yeah. already today. I guarantee you we've done, a, you know, 35, 40 minutes so far. I can promise you the last eight minutes is the part that people yeah. are going to be talking yeah. about. I think for me also, I've uh, pursued things so aggressively all the time in my life. A little thing meditation has done for me and even just me reflecting and getting a little bit older is I've started to allow certain things just to come to me that I don't have to go get everything. Yeah. I don't have to go do everything. Mm -hmm. Like I've surrendered a little bit of control and my addiction to outcome all the time yeah. and just let a little of it come yeah. my way. And I found it does. And it's the things that make us successful in one area may produce external results, but can produce internal turmoil. And there's just this nuance in our life. Like if I let go of all of my wanting to control things, all of my perfectionism, all of my drive, and all of my being hard on myself, I probably wouldn't have done some of the things I did. But it's yeah. the dosage yeah. level. Wouldn't you agree? Totally it's, agree. It's the dosage. Totally agree. Yeah. I mean, I, I I did a podcast with a former teammate of mine a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he says, talked about how tough I was as a, as a leader and mm -hmm. demanding of my teammates and and it made me cringe hmm. because I don't feel I don't feel like I'm that person today, at least not as intense. Yeah. Not I'm still intense, but not yeah. as intense. And yeah. and I told him, I said, you know, I think I would have been a I think I would have been a different teammate if we were playing today. Mm -hmm. You know, and I and I really I cringe when I hear you say that. Yeah. And he was like, What are you talking about? That's why we were able to do what we were able to do. Mm -hmm. And so I've had this conversation with others, mm -hmm. not on a podcast, but I've <laughs> had it, I, I, it I've had it with others <laughs> and and they say, Yeah, but that allowed you to do what you did. So I yeah. totally understand what you're saying. Yeah. I wonder. I bet yeah, you I, do too. I, I wonder I could wonder. I produce the same results with a little bit more Totally. I watched a speech of me from like twenty years ago with a company that I had and gosh I cringed too I'm like what a jerk yeah. like, I thought I was being super intense but yeah. like there's just a line there I'll tell you what happened to me and then we'll, we'll move on but just to share because I, I feel like this is important for everybody to hear from both of us because they look at whatever we both done in our lives right. and go that's the that's that's what I want to be some of it you do and some of it you don't I was at a friend's house not that long ago he was with his kids this is not a financially successful dude but man he's a rich man it's got a rich life, rich relationships. And I was there like an hour and a half, and there was such laughter in their home. I'm talking about like belly laughing joy. You ever been in a home like that? And I'm like, and I could tell it wasn't just for me being there. Yeah. It was like this family 
has joy and bliss. I got my car to leave. I've never said this on my show before, but since we're opening up, and I went, oh my gosh, like, we don't do that in my house enough. Yeah. We don't do that. This thing about me that's so wound up and tight and loving and serious and intense, all that, my kids know that I love them. I have amazing relationships. But like real letting go laughter and bliss and joy, I didn't learn that from my dad. Yeah. I didn't, mo- a lot of times we model. We might being- have the same dad. <laughs> yeah, well, really? Like, tell me that because my- oh I, som- I think sometimes you model, you may not model their life or their thoughts, but you do. You can model their emotions. Mm-hmm. And so- just there wasn't a lot of joy and laughter and bliss. And I didn't even realize the absence of it until I saw it in someone yeah. else's home. And I went, now that I'm not willing to cost myself or my children anymore. Yeah. Do you see that too? And, and how do you think we have the same dad? 100%. How are our dads the same, do you think? Well, my dad was 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 really tough. Uh, mm-hmm. Demanded a lot. Uh, you know, he treated me like I was a grown man from the time I was six years old. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and... In some ways, that's good. Mm -hmm. And I do think that in a lot of ways, that is why I was able to go on and achieve a lot of the things that I achieved. But, boy, you give up a lot. Mm -hmm. You give up a lot of childhood. Your face just changed. Yeah, you give up. Yeah. You know, you give up a lot when you're treated like that at a young age. And and, and so that was the way our house was as well. I don't recall uh, any laughter in Mm -hmm. our house. And, Mm -hmm. you know, everybody kind of walked around on eggshells. And, Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and so I don't. I'm not that way as a father, mm-hmm. but with that said, it, it there are, I'm better now, but there were times then when you were around that, it made you uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. You know, you just weren't used to experiencing that. You know, mm-hmm. you'd hear this laughter and stuff going on, and you're like, you know, it's what's going on? You know, mm-hmm. this isn't where I'm mm-hmm. most, you know, I'm not protected in this. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think that, I think I definitely could be better. Mm-hmm. Like what you're saying is like, hey, mm-hmm. m- you know, my kids, they know I adore them. And, sure. you know, we've had a great life and all that. But as far as this just exuberant laughter and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, yeah, that's that's not been. Yeah. That's not been. With, it's something worth evaluating, huh? Totally. Like, I mean, I love them. We have a blissful family. Yeah. We've enjoyed amazing experiences. But, man, maybe part of my disposition could have made it richer. Yeah. Could have made it more blissful. Yeah. Has your dad passed away? No, he's my mom passed away about three months ago. Uh, I'm sorry. My, my father, he's 84. Uh, his mom lived to be 100. Uh, he's, he's in, he's he's in gonna, great he's, shape. He's going to go. It, yeah, he's, he's, he's tough as nails, mm-hmm. you know. Do you think you were proving something to him as you were achieving? I think I, I think I always wanted to prove to him I was as tough as he was. I think mm-hmm. that was what it was. Tough. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. uh, you had to be tough to survive in our house. And, mm-hmm. uh, and I think and, – and he was pound per – pound for pound the toughest person i've i've ever known i get the feeling that uh you don't have to comment on it, i'm just gonna tell you i get the feeling i get the feeling that you love your dad a lot and that uh it was really tough and that yeah. you even protect him with what you yeah don't go to yeah. how tough it was yeah. that's the sense that i get because yeah. i'm watching your face yeah i'm seeing your face yeah. yeah anyway you're an amazing son i'm sure he's unbelievably proud of you this is getting good here dude i don't <laughs> know if you knew we were gonna do this today i don't know if you knew we were gonna do this all right i want to shift gears a little bit we don't have that much more time but i want to ask you about this one of the things I admire most about you that I that is so rare in life is that when one dream ends for most people, whether they achieve it or not, they have this. They're going to start a business and then it didn't work, mm-hmm. or they're going to be a professional athlete and it didn't happen, or they're going to have this amazing relationship and then there's a divorce or it ends. I really admire people who have a second act, whether they achieve the first dream or not. They come back and they're like, "Man, I made my second dream happen in my life." And you've done that. Like I said it earlier, you had this prolific career. I mean, really, one of the great careers in the history of the sport you played. And then you get into this broadcasting thing, and you're, you know, you're becoming an iconic brand doing that. You and Buck are the best. Thank you. And it's, and it's not even really argued, I don't think, by anybody else. I think Collinsworth and these other guys do a great job. But, like, the brand, there's a reason why you paid the way you're paid to do it. When you got into that, were you intentional at becoming great at that as well? And like, I'm going to do this for the next 20 years of my life. Is it the same type of preparation, psycho Troy Aikman that you were doing before? Uh, yeah. So when when I was retiring, first of all, the way I got into broadcasting was I was still playing. Uh, I had I, I ended up playing two more years, but it was 1998. Uh, the radio. Uh, play-by-play guy for the Dallas Cowboys uh he's only done radio and they had NFL Europe back then where yeah he, and I asked him I said why don't you ever go over to NFL Europe and and call games and he said well I, I'd like to but you know they just 
haven't given me an opportunity. And I said, well, they've been asked, Fox has been asking me to go over there for years. I said, why don't, why don't we go? You can do play by play. I'll do color, but um, I, I, you know, I'm, I, w- I had no interest in television. But but uh, you know, I'll get a couple weeks in Europe and call a couple games, and then you'll get to go do that. You know, and so he said, yeah. So I told Fox that I would do it, but I wanted Brad to be my play by play guy, and so that's how it started. I had, like I said, I had zero interest in broadcasting, but when I called the game with him, I just had a great time calling mm-hmm. it. You know, I mean, I, because I, I always wondered how can guys talk for three hours Me about too. it. You know, yeah. I'm not, I'm just not a that big of a talker. You know, mm-hmm. but then you do the work, you prepare, and you talk to players and coaches, and you realize you have all kinds of things to talk about. You know, you don't have enough time to talk about all the things that you wanted to. So, I really enjoyed it. And at the end of that game, I got a call from a guy named Ed Gorn who was with Fox Sports, and he's become one of my closest friends. And uh, he said, hey, when you retire from football, if you want to broadcast, we, we'll have a job for you. And I yeah. thought, oh, so that was the first time I started even thinking that I might do this. Mm. And then when I did retire from football, Matt Millen had been the number two guy, yeah. and he left to go become the GM of the Detroit Lions. Mm-hmm. And he had been behind John Madden for years there. And, and so I think he was a little worn out from all that. But anyway, I retired, and, and they put me in the number two booth. Mm. And then after one year – John Madden decided to go to Monday Night Football and work for ABC, and the next thing I knew, they were pairing me with Joe Buck and Chris Collinsworth. So we were in a three-man booth for a while. But, Ed, I really thought I would do it for a couple years and then figure out what I really wanted to do with my life, and, and, and then I'd go do that. And I always thought that I'd be in the front office for a team. I could see that. Yeah, I always thought yeah. that – you know, I had definite thoughts when I was a player, and, mm-hmm. and most quarterbacks do, as mm-hmm. to how you build the team, what mm-hmm. you need, and the type of guys you want. Uh, so that's what I thought that I was going to do. But then I got divorced, mm. and my girls were really young. Mm. And it it just was not something I could do. Uh, mm. I was a single father, uh, and broadcasting was the greatest job for that because I was only gone on the weekend yeah. during football season. Mm. I was home all week, could drive them to school, pick them up, mm. uh, go to all their school functions. And then in the off season, I was totally theirs. Mm. And so – Uh, my youngest just finished her sophomore year of college. So it wasn't until two years ago that if I really wanted to pursue that, then I could have. So broadcasting was not in my long-term plans, but Mm -hmm. then it, it, it happened because of my personal life. Uh, but yeah, my preparation is every bit as intense as it was as a player. It's just a little bit different. Of course, it's not physical. It's just more, more Mm -hmm. mental. And, but, uh, I put in a lot of time and, and I feel like I, however you broadcast is really totally up to you mm-hmm. and if it's accepted by the audience is it when they listen to you but mm-hmm. uh, I just always have believed that you can't fake it so for me to be totally prepared and feel comfortable being ready to call the game I've got to put in so much time just so I have com- a comfort level you know you, it's, you, and others may be able to do it with less work mm-hmm. And maybe they're smarter than I am, and they just work a little bit better than I do. I don't know. But is this articulate version of you? Like I'm being serious too. You were, you said you're not you're an unbelievable communicator. Is that a muscle that's grown since you've been doing it? Or when if I were to go back and watch that first broadcast? Oh, you know, it's it's grown. Yeah, it's grown. Yeah. Okay. And the the other part of this is that you know they, there wasn't social media when I started. Mm. Um, I said a lot of dumb. Dumb, I still do, but <laughs> but I'd say dumb things, and it's like you're you know that perfectionist again yeah. is like saying in your head you're yeah. an idiot. I mean, what are you? Gosh, yeah. you know, how could you say such a dumb thing? And and but you didn't read about it. <laughs> it's you not know, as soon as you finished, yeah, Twitter it wasn't. Yeah, Instagram. exactly. It wasn't yeah. on you know Instagram, and you know. So I was fortunate in that sense. You know, yeah. the people that get into this business now, really any anyone, you get into the you know, you're a rookie quarterback all over mm-hmm. again, and just the the platform that everybody has to weigh in on mm-hmm. your performance is much different. I mean, these athletes are much more heavily scrutinized than I ever was when I came in. Yeah, I think the thing I'm just thinking I'm listening to you. I've got a couple more things I want to ask you. I wish we could go three hours, honestly, but you know, I think the thing I'm most impressed with you is you appear to me to be getting better as a human the older you get, and. Um, that's impressive because you came from a pretty high place in the first place, you know, but physically, spiritually, mentally, um, your ability to think and articulate your thoughts is all at a, a higher level than it was even 15 and 20 yeah. years ago. Yeah. That's impressive. Or, th- or even three years ago. Super impressive. Know? Now, talk about preparation. There's one thing you can't prepare for. I just, I, I wanted to ask you this since it happened. Um, you were calling the DeMar uh, yeah. Hamlin game. Yeah. You can't prepare for that. Yeah. 
what in the world? Everybody knows what I'm talking about, but the Buffalo Bills guy that ended up going to cardiac arrest, they thought he probably had died on the field that night. He's actually coming back and playing this year, which is unbelievable yeah. to me. But what's that like, number one, that situation? Then two, you are now on live television in front of millions of people, and you have no preparation for something like this. So all this preparation, Troy Aikman stuff, that's out the window. Yeah. What was that experience like? Well, unlike anything that I've ever experienced. I mean, it went from a sportscast to a newscast, uh, mm. and and it looked pretty dire. Yeah. You know, uh, when it happened uh, – we, I've seen head injury, everybody has on television, uh, and that's initially what it looked like, mm-hmm. was that DeMar had gotten hit, and he started to get up, and then he wobbled a little, and then he goes down. Um, but it, it didn't take but a few seconds, uh, less than a minute, to really understand the gravity of the situation with the mm-hmm. people that were out. And what we had privilege of seeing with our cameras that the public was not seeing was the amount of attention and the CPR that was being administered uh, in order to keep him alive. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they, it, was, it was feverish. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it was going on quite some time. Mm-hmm. I didn't think he was going to make it, mm-hmm. quite honestly. <clears throat> now, that, that broadcast, or the way that we at least covered it, uh, I, I actually did very little. Uh, Joe Buck did the heavy lifting mm-hmm. that night, and, mm-hmm. and I told him this. And I'll tell her, all your viewers, I, I've seen Joe uh, do some amazing things as a broadcaster uh, in some big moments, in big games, uh, the biggest of games, where he's been just perfect. And I thought this was his finest hour. Really? I mean, I thought he was amazing. Mm. <clears throat> there was no real direction for him because nobody knew yeah. nobody knew what we were doing mm-hmm. uh nobody knew really the situation we weren't getting much information we didn't know how long we were going to be on the air right. there with espn and abc or were we going to throw it to someone else and you didn't even know if the game was going to continue for a while didn't right? know yeah, yeah none of that yeah. uh so it's a it it turned into an amazing story because mm-hmm. w- joe and i were in new york for what they call the upfronts for espn and demar hamlin came out on stage with us we'd never met him and uh, it was, it was fantastic. I get a little emotional about That's it just because, uh, you know, w- shoot that night. Mm-hmm. You know, we didn't know if we didn't even know if he was going to live. But mm-hmm. uh, but for him, when I've seen him prior to even meeting him, his platform that he's been given, mm-hmm. and what he's done with that, mm-hmm. uh, is really really Impressive. remarkable. I mean, there's some there's some good work being done through mm-hmm. that young man, and 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 how he's kind of taken this the mantle and and just making the most of, mm-hmm. of the opportunity that he has to reach so many people yeah so are you today well, thank you so are you today thank you let me ask you one more thing mm-hmm. first off i gotta tell you i really enjoyed today yeah me too a lot thank you. I, I think we're gonna be friends for a long time i uh, admire you and i like you um i love seeing somebody just get better and better as a person and i see that in you as all of this please answer this as honestly as you can because we all know what like the easy answer is is like all this worth it, this meticulous routine you've got, all the discipline, all the sacrifices, all the weight room stuff, all the film prep that you did, all the media you've had to do, then the transition to going into broadcasting, and now you're an entrepreneur, which, by the way, go get your eight beer if you're in Texas until we can get it to you everywhere <laughs> yes. else. Um, is, is it worth it? Would it have been okay for you now at your 56? Mm-hmm. If I said, hey, Troy, life didn't, you didn't win any Super Bowls, you didn't play in the NFL, you're not in the Hall of Fame, uh, you know, you're not a TV icon guy now, but you've had a pretty good life. You did all right, man. It, you, you got out of here. You didn't hurt anybody. Yeah. Everything turned out okay, but man, you got, you didn't have to do all this stuff you've had to do. Right. Would you be okay with that life and is the one you chose worth it? Yeah. The, the life I've chosen is definitely worth it. You know, I mean, I have I have no regrets. Um, there's nothing I look back on and think, ah, man, I wish I'd have wish I'd have done that a little bit differently. I mean, I know that I've given up a lot, um, but there's a balance. I mean, you've got to you've got to strike a balance uh, for me in terms of what what motivated me to achieve. I've always felt like like there's another mountain to climb, um, and my the people who find contentment, uh, I used to think contentment was a four letter word, Mm -hmm. but now I really admire those that are content Mm -hmm. as long as it's, as long as it's, 
put in the right context, right? I think it was authentic. My sister, uh, who's very successful, she's the CEO of the largest hospital in Oklahoma. She has, she has contentment, and mm-hmm. you know, and 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 I admire that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I now am finding contentment, mm-hmm. um, but before I I I could never have uh, been in that space. So I feel like I've been a, a really good father, uh, which has o- been the only thing that's mattered to me is being, a, you know, if my girls at the end of my life say, hey, my dad was a great father, if they tell people, then then, then nothing else matters. I mean, you say, hey, you're not really thought of as being a top five all-time quarterback. I don't care. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I think I could maybe make that top five uh, all-time dad list. And so that's what that's what motivates me. That's what matters to me. Uh, all the other stuff, because our, our story is going to be told by those who know us best. It's not going to be the people who, the fans that were thrilled that we won Super Bowls. And, but, you know, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, and so, I do. Um, but, yeah, I feel like it's, it's, it's definitely been worth it. Um, and, and I'm thrilled with where I'm at. I mean, life just keeps getting better. Um, so yeah, I'm I think happy. it's because you're getting better. Yeah, uh, didn't know that when uh, we booked you for the show that we would talk about these things today. Yeah, and I'm really grateful that we did. Yeah, and I, I want too. you to know if there's anything I can ever do for you, um, I'm here to help you Thank in you. any way that I can. You're stud. Oh, appreciate and, it. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah, my audience is going to share the heck out of this thing here today, yeah. brother. This was outstanding. One of the best conversations I've ever had on or off camera. Wow. I enjoyed it. It means a lot. Enjoyed it very, very much. Hey, guys, um, make sure you follow Troy. He's on uh, social media at Troy Aikman, or as my producer Sasha said today, Troy Ackman (laughs) is coming on the show today, and she's super excited about it. So follow (laughs) Troy on uh, on Instagram. You can get Drink 8 Beer on Instagram also, and you can also grab a copy of The Power of One More, which is the greatest book written in 2023 by this guy, Ed Milet. You gotta get another <laughs> copy of it. God bless you all, everybody. Max out your life.